Bismillahi awwaluhu wa akhiru. Welcome to the third session of our seminar on an introduction to Islamic eschatology here at the Coombs Farm in Croydon in London. And uh, we thank Allah who in his kindness has allowed us to teach this subject. Uh, it is not an easy subject. But by Allah's kindness and grace and guidance, we are able to present to you in this session two main actors in the stage of the world in the end time. The first is an individual and the second a people. The Arabs did not know how to deal with this phenomenon of someone who was born in their midst and who grew up so truthful and trustworthy that they even gave him the name Al-Amin, the truthful one, the trustworthy one. And yet, when he was fully 40 years of age, excuse me, and a grown-up man, nothing crooked in him, at this age he should stun them in declaring that he is a prophet of the one God, like unto Abraham and Moses and Jesus, alayhi salam. They didn't know how to deal with this. So they said, let us send a delegation to the northern city of Yathrib, now known as Medina. Uh, because there are large numbers of Jews over there. And they have had numerous prophets. So maybe they can help us. How can we determine whether or not he is indeed a prophet? Uh, you will find this analysis in my book entitled Surat al-Kaf and the Modern Age. So the, the delegation went to the northern city of Yathrib and met with the rabbis. And they said, ask him these three questions which only a prophet can answer. And if he answers them correctly, then he is indeed a true prophet. The answers, of course, are with them, the rabbis, so only they can confirm that the answers are correct. Question number one, ask him about the great traveler who traveled to the two ends of the land. Strange question. Only a prophet knows it. Ask him, number two, about the young man and the cave. Strange question. Only a prophet knows. Question number three, ask him about the ruh, the spirit. So the Arabs, the delegation came back to Makkah and uh, the Arab, the leaders of the Quraysh came to Nabi Muhammad with the three questions. And uh, Allah sent down the answers in the Quran. But two of the answers are in one surah of the Quran, Surah al kaf And the third answer is in another surah the one that came before Surah Al-Kaf, which is Surah Al-Isra. 
which also has a second name it's called Surah to Bani Israel. Indeed, what is being conveyed to us is that there is a dynamic link between these two surahs. Surah to Bani Israel and Surah to Kaf. If you want to understand Surah to Kaf, you're going to have to use Surah to Bani Israel in particular to understand Surah to Kaf. When Allah sent down the answers, He did it in a, in a special way. And that is that he first repeated the question and then he gave the answer. For example, وَيَسْأَلُونَكَ عَنِ الرُّوحِ بَعَلَوْزُ بِاللَّهِ مِنَ الشَّيْطَانِ الرَّجِيمِ And they question thee about the ruh, O Muhammad قُلِ الرُّوحُ مِنْ أَمْرِ رَبِّ And then Allah answers the question. And then, وَيَسْأَلُونَكَ عَنْ ذِي الْقَرْنَيْنِ And they question thee, O Muhammad, sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam, about the great traveler, who is known as Zul Karnayn. And then Allah proceeds to answer the question. But wait a minute. Insofar as question three is concerned, he does not repeat the question. Indicating that there is something special about this one which he wants to remain concealed. There's a cover over it. This is why he does not repeat the question. You have to study the Quran with great care. Nothing happens by accident in the Quran. So when we Deal with question three, we know we got to look underneath to find what is it. The question concerning the ruh is very important. Because the Messiah is also known as a ruh. And the Jews believe that the Messiah who is to come is a Ruh. So that's why they ask about the Ruh, connected with the Messiah. But in answering the question, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala simply said, Kuli Ruh min amri rabbi. <laughs> Say to them, the Ruh is from my Lord. Bas fakat, that's it. So he does not disclose anything more. No. وَمَا أُوْتِيْتُ مِنَ الْإِلْمِ إِلَّا قَلِيلًا And I have not given you knowledge except a little bit. So they're still waiting. They want to know about the Ruh and the Messiah. And he does not give it to them. When the Prophet ﷺ delivered this message from Allah, this is the answer. The, the answer reached them in Yathrib. It reached them. So when the Hijra took place and the Prophet ﷺ is now in Medina, they came to him and they asked him, the Jews. They said, O oh Muhammad wasallam." When Allah said that I have not given you knowledge except just a little bit, was he referring to us or was he referring to the Arabs? Because they believe they are the elite of mankind, the intellectual elite, the chosen of the Lord God. And I referred to Surah Al Jum'ah, you remember? In Zamtum Annakum Awliya Ulillahi Mindunines. If you believe that you are the chosen people of the Lord God, 
to the exclusion of the rest of mankind. Fataman naul mauta in kuntum sadikin. Come on, why don't you desire death? So there is a reference to the chosen people in the Quran and Allah has rejected it. So the Prophet replied to them and said, Allah was referring to both of you, to the Jews as well as to the pagan Arabs. If you want knowledge, you have to come to this Nabi and to this book. And so we are a people blessed by Allah with knowledge that they don't have. What are we doing with it? I'll tell you. We eat our biryani and go to sleep. <laughs> That's what we're doing. Allah has given to us knowledge that no one else has. And we're just sitting with it and fighting with each other over peanuts and eating biryani and going to sleep. That is the pathetic state of this ummah. So they were stunned by that answer. So what is the relationship between the Messiah and the Ruh? When it came to question number two, the great traveler who traveled to the two ends of the land, and he's known by this nickname of Dhul Karnain, the one who possesses two Karn. A Karn is a horn, so Karnain two horns, or a Karn can be a generation, a people, an age, an epoch. Which one is it? The Quran has never used the word come to mean a horn. Never. Every time the Quran has used the word come, it's the other meaning. Every time. Never, never, never to mean horn. So proper methodology is to be consistent. So when the Quran uses the term Zulkarnain, consistency requires that we must accept it to refer to someone who impacts on two ages, on two people. And he's someone who has faith. Yes. And he's someone who's endowed with power. Allah gave him power. And he can pursue whatever objective he chooses to pursue. And how does he use his power? When power rests on the foundations of faith, how is it used? When power rests on the foundations of faith, how is power used? He travels in the direction of the setting of the sun. And he reaches a body of water. And it is dark and murky, meaning visibility is very shallow. And there he comes across the people and Allah says, how, how would you treat with them? How would you deal with them? And his, his response is those who are guilty of oppression and wickedness and injustice, I'll punish them. So power is used to punish the oppressor. And when they return to you, you will also punish them. So when power rests on the foundations of faith, there's harmony between this world and that. And those who are righteous in conduct and have faith, I will treat them nicely and reward them. So when power rests on the foundations of faith, power assists those who live the religious way of life. What will be the opposite of that? Watch it. Watch it. Then he travels in the opposite direction to the rising of the sun. If on this side he is blocked by a body of water, and if he is traveling to the two ends of the land, 
you don't need a PhD <laughs> to understand that there'll be a body of water on that side also. Otherwise, you keep on traveling all around the earth. So we're looking for a geographical location where there's a body of water to the west and a body of water to the east. And there he comes across the people and Allah is very, very, very economical in his use of language. لَمْ نَجْعَلْ لَهُمْ مِنْ دُونِهَا سِتْرَ Very economical in the use of language. Very few words. Maybe a people living a primitive way of life and Allah knows best. So how are you going to deal with them? And Zulkarnayn has the wisdom and the compassion and the sense of respect for human rights to allow them to continue to live undisturbed. So it is the characteristic of power when it rests on the foundations of faith that it respects human rights even of a people who live the primitive way of life. What could be the opposite of that? Hmm? And then he travels in a third direction. And we know that it has to be north. And there he comes across a range of mountains And there's a pass between the mountains. So our geographical inquiry now is for a body of water to the left, a body of water to the right, and a mountain range between them. An impassable mountain range with a pass in between. One pass. And we know the shape of the pass. The shape of the pass is like sadafain. The two sides of a shell, that's the shape, the two sides of a shell. Palamasa was sadafain. And there he comes across the people. Layakaduna if kahuna kaula. These are a unique people who speak a unique language, not connected with the regional languages. So the geography increases now by which we can recognize where we are. It has to be a body of water on this side, a body of water on this side, a mountain range in between that is in impassable and between it there is a pass, one pass, only one and the people who are resident there speak a unique language unconnected with the regional languages and these people then say to him in the that Gog and Magog are committing fasad in our territory. Fasad is not just corruption, to corrupt something. You know, like corrupting money. Fasad is more than that. It is that which corrupts and in the process destroys. And so Allah reserves the worst punishment of all for fasad fill up cut off their hands and cut off the legs from opposite sides and crucify them. Hmm? Fasad. And these are agents of Fasad, Gog and Magog. If they are agents of Fasad, and Fasad is sinful conduct, unjust conduct, can they be angels? Huh? No, 
Because angels don't commit sin. Angels don't oppress. Well then, if they're not angels, can they be jinn? That's a possibility, yes. The jinn can be unjust. Or they can be human beings. Unless you did your PhD in Disneyland or in Hollywood. It's either angels or jinn or human beings, nothing else. Nothing else that Allah created as beings. Angels and jinn and human beings. So you are cornered now with your schoolboy methodology. Gog and Magog have to be either jinn or human beings. Can they be jinn? They ask him, we prepared to help you, to pay you. Can you build a barrier to contain them? And he builds a barrier made of iron and steel. Can you contain the jinn with a barrier built with iron and steel? The jinn will pass through the barrier. So they can't be jinn. So they have to be human beings. When Allah sent human beings from heaven to live on earth, did he send them to live in the interior of the earth? Walakum fil abdi mustaqarrun wa mata'un ilaheen. You're going to live on earth, and earth will be your place of abode and sustenance. And sustenance. Can human beings live in the interior of the earth and be provided with sustenance? Where did that rubbish come from? From which garbage bin did that rubbish come from? When will they learn proper methodology, these schoolboys? Corrupting people's thinking. And when you try to teach them, it goes through one ear and it comes out of the other. So leave them, leave them, leave them and let's move forward. I have had enough of their nonsense and I'm fed up of them. Gog and Magog have to be not only human beings because they're committing facade and angels cannot commit facade and the jinn cannot be contained by a barrier. So Gog and Magog have to be human. This is elementary logic, not sophisticated logic. But also Gog and Magog will have to be resident on the face, on the surface of the earth. Walakum fil adi mustaqar, wa mataun ilahin. Because Allah sent us to live on the surface of the earth, which can sustain us. But the schoolboy cannot understand that, so he's still insisting they're living like ants down in the interior of the earth. So leave the schoolboy with his nonsense. So he builds the barrier, and they are contained. And then he says, "Hada rahmatu mi Rabbi, fa idha jaa wa'ad Rabbi jaalahu dakka, wa kana wa'ad Rabbi haqqa." I have built this, and this is a rahmah for my Rabb, an act of kindness. But when that time comes of which my Lord has warned, Allah is going to bring down the barrier, and they'll be released. And then the promise of my Lord, or rather the warning of my Lord, will come to pass. And so in the first of the two ages, and the people, The world is safe from Gog and Magog. 
But in the second of the Karnain, they will be released. And the world will have to face Gog and Magog. This is the Karnain, two currents. In the first one, power rested on the foundations of faith. But in the second one, power is used to oppress. They are agents of facade. So these cannot be a people of faith. So power rests now on foundations which are godless. And power is used in the second of the two currents to oppress. But Allah speaks in a hadith al-Qudsi in Sahih Muslim, I have created creatures of mine, meaning Gog and Magog, so powerful that none but I can destroy them. So when they are let loose, when Allah brings down the barrier, you cannot stand up to them. No, not even Dhul Qarnayn. Only Allah can destroy them. But what you can do is to use a language of a game called chess. You can checkmate them. And that's what Zulkarnain did when he bit the barrier. They were checkmated. He checkmated them the first time. And he'll checkmate them the second time as well, after they have been released. And so now we know that what the Jews, the rabbis were questioning him about was whether he knew about Gog and Magog. That's what they wanted to know. But that's the third journey, whereas they ask only about the first and the second. You see the, you see the strategy? Only a prophet would know about the third journey. And only a prophet would know about Gog and Magog. So when they get the answer, now they're stunned with the answer. Then Allah spoke secondly in the Quran about Gog and Magog. Uh, he says, وَحَرَامٌ عَلَىٰ قَرْيَةٍ أَهْلَقْنَاهَا أَنَّهُمْ لَا يَرْجِعُونَ La Yerdi'un, Abara, a town which was destroyed and the people of the town were expelled and then a ban was placed on them that they could never return to reclaim this town as their own. Abara, ever, Kabine, Hatta, Iza Futi Hatya Ajuju, Wama Ajuju. Until Gog and Magog are released. Notice the language. Notice the language. Futihat. Futihat. Released. He didn't say Ba'atha. Ba'atha is to send. This is Futihat. To release. When Gog and Magog are released, وَهُمْ مِنْ كُلِّ حَدَبٍ يَنْسِلُونَ And then with their indestructible power, they spread out all over the world. And they take control of the world in what is we, the, the world order of Gog and Magog. When that happens, then you see these people being brought back to this town to reclaim it as their own. If the schoolboy wants to say it is Chicago, well, that's up to him. We know that it is Jerusalem. And that the Quran is saying that when Jerusalem was destroyed and the Jews were expelled and then a ban was placed on them for 2,000 years, they could never return. When you see them returning to the Holy Land after 2,000 years, then that is the mother of all signs. That those who are bringing them back to the Holy Land are Gog and Magog.
And so Gog and Magog are connected with Dajjal, of course. Because in order for Dajjal to fulfill his mission of impersonation of the true Messiah, and the true Messiah has to bring back the Khilafah state, the holy state, in Jerusalem. And it must become the ruling state in the world. And he, the Messiah, will rule over that ruling state in the world. And may I pause to remind you once again, and I think I'm going to have to keep on reminding you until I die. I will have to keep on reminding you until I die. And even so, there will still be those who will not understand. <laughs> the brainwashing is so profound and so intense. That Allah sent the Messiah to Banu Israel. If you don't believe me, check it out. Go and look in the Quran. Find it there. Twice in the Quran he says it. That he sent the Messiah to Banu Israel. And if there is any change in that, only Allah can change it. You cannot. Only Allah can change it. And if there is any change in that, it must be in the ayat muhkamat of the Quran, not in the mutashabihat. But there is no such thing in the ayat muhkamat of the Quran. None. And so the conclusion is that when Nabi Isa alayhi islam returns, he is coming back to them, Banu Israel. And those who follow him, those who follow him from that ummah, they are the ones who are going to be raised. وَجَاعِلُ الَّذِينَ تَبَعُوكَ وَجَاعِلُ الَّذِينَ تَبَعُوكَ فَوْكَ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا إِلَى يَوْمِ الْقِيَامَةِ Surah to Ali Imran. That Allah is going to raise them who follow Jesus alayhi salam when he returns. He will raise them to a position of dominance over those who are committing kufr against him. Which is that world of Gog and Magog out there, which controls power in the world today. Mm. And so that ruling state in the world, mm, over which he will rule, Nabi Isa Islam, will not be people who follow Muhammad Islam. Someone has to do some rethinking and remove the brainwashing. We will have our Khilafah state. And I quoted to you from Surah An-Nur. بَعَدَ اللَّهُ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا مِنْكُمْ وَعَمِلُوا الصَّالِحَاتِ لَيَسْتَخْلِفَنَّهُمْ فِي الْأَرْضِ كَمَا اسْتَخْلَفَ الَّذِينَ مِنْ قَبْلِهِمْ إِلَىٰ آخِرِ الْآيَةِ So yes, and we will have Imam Al-Mahdi. And it will be there in Mecca. And these two will cooperate and collaborate with each other. If he is to impersonate the true Messiah, then that false Messiah will also have to rule the world from Jerusalem. So he'll have to liberate the Holy Land, which is under Muslim rule, for a thousand years. And he'll have to bring the Jews back to the Holy Land. They've been dispersed. Who will bring them back? Allah says it's going to be Gog and Magog. So Gog and Magog are working with Dajjal. In bringing the Jews back to the Holy Land. But they first have to liberate the Holy Land. The same people who liberate the Holy Land for the Jews are the same people who will bring the Jews back to the Holy Land. And it's the same people who will revive a state of Israel in the Holy Land for Dajjal. And that Israel, that holy Israel has to become the ruling state in the world. 
So the Gog and Magog are acting on behalf of the Dajjal. And only when that state of Israel becomes a ruling state in the world, only then, only then can Dajjal declare, I am the Messiah. And uh, rub his hands and say, crick, crack, the wire bend, and that's the way the story ends. Mission accomplished. So there you are. The link between Gog and Magog and Dajjal, you cannot study these two subjects in isolation. You've got to be able to connect the dots. You've got to be able to see the link between the two. The Prophet said, alayhi salatu was salam, that when Dajjal is released, he will live on earth for 40 days. Yawmun kasana, a day which will be like a year. Yawmun kashar, a day which will be like a month. Yawmun kajum'a, a day which will be like a week. Wasailu ayyamihi ka ayyamikum. And all his days, meaning all the rest of his days, like your days. In other words, Dajjal is going to have a mission comprised of three stages. Three stages. Before he enters into our world of space and time, when his day is like our day. Prior to this, you can't see him. He is here, but you can't see him. So what? The jinn are here, can you see them? The angels are here, right on your shoulders, can you see them? No. So the jar is here. But you can't see him until the three stages are over and then he enters into our world of space and time and he's born of a human being. I mentioned this in the last session. The Quran now explains to us that there's also an addition way of recognizing these three stages. In Surat al-Mursalat, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks and he says, Intaliku, intaliku, proceed. Go on, let the historical process now unfold. Ila zillin, to a shadow. This is the shadow. In order for there to be a shadow, there must be something to create a shadow. This is the shadow of that. إِلَى ذِلِّنْ ذِي ثَلَاثِ شُعَبْ A shadow is going to come upon the world. And that shadow will emerge in three stages, will have three parts. Mm -hmm. And our interpretation, and of course you know, when you interpret, you must say Allah knows best. Because only Allah, only He can confirm that in, an interpretation of Mutashabihat is correct, only Allah. So we make an interpretation, we have the right to do so. Allah sent the Quran, they call me a He didn't send the Quran to a people who eat biryani and go home and sleep. He sent the Quran to a people who think. And we say that the three stages of the shadow are the three parts of the mission of Dajjal. That the first part of the shadow will be quite long and the second part will be shorter and the third part will be quite short. And only after these three parts of the shadow have been completed will the shadow disappear and the man come himself in person Al-Masih dajjal It looks very much as though he's already been released. Nabi Muhammad wasalam, had a companion whose name was Tamim Buddhari. He was a Christian from Palestine, from Abdul Muqaddasa. He took the shahad and became Muslim. And uh, he came to the Prophet والسلام, and narrated something which we must understand to have been a vision, not an actual event. 
And then the prophet said, this confirms what I've been saying to you. And then he narrated the event. The Tamim Odari and some 40 of his companions went on a ship and a storm blew them until eventually after one month's travel, they reached an island. Mm -hmm. And when they got off the ship, they were confronted by a very hairy creature or beast. It says, I am Jassa, a spy, spying. Walata Jassasu, Jassasa, spying. So an island with expertise in espionage and spying. James Bond kind of stuff. Sounds familiar? <laughs> Jasasa has so much hair that you can't tell which side is head and which side is tail. Like uh, in lower Manhattan, sometimes you can't tell who is a man and who is a woman. <laughs> so, <laughs> an island which conceals its true identity. An island which conceals its true identity and an island with PhD in deception and espionage. Oh yes, PhD in deception and espionage. And just as I said, there's someone waiting to see you, pointing to a monastery which is lying in ruins, meaning this is an island in which religion is going to collapse. And the churches and synagogues are going to be sold to McDonald's hamburgers and Kentucky Fry. And you go into a masjid to perform salat and you, oh, no, no, this used to be a church. We bought it from them. <laughs> this used to be a synagogue. We bought it from them. Huh? Otherwise it would be a, what is it called? Um, a pizza hut. Ah, yes. It used to be, it used to be a church, and now it's Pizza Hut. This is what this island is going to be like. And there's someone waiting to see you. So we rushed to the monastery lying in ruins. And there we met him, the Jal. He was powerfully built, yeah. And, uh, but he had his hands chained to his neck. And he had his feet chained together. And we have a physical description about him. And if he was one-eyed, then we had to be blind not to see it. If this was a man with only one eye, his left eye, and his right eye was blind and looked like a bulging grip, you know, we had to be blind not to see it. But we were not blind. And we were giving a description about him. And there's nothing, nothing, nothing in that description about a man with one eye. Mind you, <laughs> be careful. And then the John asked them a number of questions. And uh, then finally he said, I am the Jal, and when I'm released, I'm going to enter every town and every city, including London, of course. But I'll not be allowed to enter Mecca and Medina. So which island is this? When he's released in a day which is like a year, it is from this island, in the first stage of the shadow, that he has to commence his mission to eventually rule the world from Jerusalem. If you want to tell me it is Taiwan, well, fine, that's your choice. Uh, he says Singapore, fine, that's your choice. We're not going to argue with you, <laughs> okay? But we say it is the island of Britain. 
And they say, oh, what a fool is this Sheikh Imran Hussein. He never studied geography at school. They didn't teach geography in Trinidad in the Caribbean. He doesn't know. The prophet said that the Dajjal will come from the east, 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 and Britain is to the west. Poor Imran who said he doesn't know geography. <laughs> hmm. So leave them. We come back to that nonsense. <laughs> When the Jal is released, he's not going to be in our world of space and time. There is no east and no west in other worlds. East and west belong only to this material universe. But the schoolboy doesn't know that. So the only time east and west will apply to the Jal is when he emerges in our world of space and time. But the schoolboy doesn't know that. It is at that time that he'll come from the east, when he emerges in our world of space and time, but the schoolboy doesn't know that. Before that, he's not in our world of space and time. We say, Britain fits, fits the description. How else can we explain? that the, the prince of modern Western civilization, this is Britain, the prince of modern Western civilization. Modern Western civilization came as a secular society, secular civilization, with a secular political philosophy, with a secular model of a state. And Britain is par excellence, the secular model of a state. So why should a secular model of a state be obsessed with a holy land and the holy state of Israel? It doesn't fit the bill. <laughs> huh? The only way we can explain Britain's obsession with the holy land, that they should wage jihad, wage jihad to liberate the holy land. And eventually, it is a British commander, British general, a man named Allenby, who, who leads a British army with Arabs fighting faithfully with him and Punjabis fighting faithfully with him, who defeat the Turkish, the Ottoman army, and in 1917 enters Jerusalem to liberate it. And when Alan B. entered Jerusalem, guess what this prince of the secular world said? He said, today the Crusades have ended. <laughs> Confirming that Britain was part and parcel of a holy war, a secular state and a holy war. This is the deception. The Balfour Declaration came from Britain that Her Majesty's government will now work for the establishment of a Jewish state, a Jewish homeland in the Holy Land. How can you explain that? There's no explanation other than they're doing this on behalf of the Dajjal. And then when they conquered Jerusalem, the Holy Land then entered into British possession. Britain now ruled over the Holy Land in what is known as a mandate. Mandated by who? By God? <laughs> Mandated by whom? The Holy Land. And Britain rules over the Holy Land until 1948. Yeah? And then how is power transferred? Whenever Britain had to decolonize, the British were meticulously punctual in ensuring a legal transfer of power. You must have constitutions in place. You must have an entirely foolproof transfer of power from the colonial power to the new regime. And then you have the, you know, the flag and the national anthem and all these things. Every time they did it, 
except this one. For this, there was no transfer of power. No. They left like a thief in the dark. We say the island is Britain. And we say that the first stage of the shadow gave to the world Pax Britannica and gave to the world the sterling pound as the universal currency, bogus and fraudulent money used to rip off mankind. And then we say the second stage of the shadow was Pax Americana. And now the US dollar replaces the sterling pound. And the United States displays the same obsession with the Holy Land and with Israel up to this moment, up to this moment. And we say that the United States is acting on behalf of Dajjal, that this is a second stage. And we say that we are now in that moment of time when stage two of the shadow is about to be replaced by stage three. In Teliko, Ilazilin Zi Salas is sharp. In Teliko, Ilazilin Zi Salas is sharp. And the Pax Americana is about to be replaced by Pax Judaica. So that Israel can rule the world. So we say that. Dajjal has already completed most of his mission. He had to first liberate the Holy Land. He did that with Gog and Magog, 1917. He had to bring the Jews back to the Holy Land. He did that with Gog and Magog, between 1917 and 1948. He had to restore a state of Israel in the Holy Land and get them to believe that this is Holy Israel. He's done that. He did it in 1948, and he has to cause that Israel to become the ruling state in the world. And that's why you have cryptocurrency now. Oh, yes. That's why you have cryptocurrencies and bitcoins. But if you study the subject in isolation, you won't be able to understand. If you understand the subject as a whole, then you realize that bitcoins and cryptocurrencies are there to facilitate the process of dismantling this monetary system, which is under the control of governments, to replace it eventually with one currency for all of mankind under the control of Israel. So we say that the Jal is already released. And when a day like a week has ended, then Dajjal will be able to then proclaim himself to be the Messiah. But this is our next session that's coming. The timeline of events with which history will end. I have done a lot in one hour. I can't believe it. <laughs> I have introduced you to the two major actors of the end time. Uh, I have introduced you to Al-Masih dajjal and I have introduced you to Gog and Magog. And now there remains only one thing more. I can take five minutes and we can end. What is this business about the Jasad? What is the implication? Because he has to be born as a human being. And our Prophet described him that he'll be a Jew. He'll be a young man. He'll be powerfully built. He'll have the curls that the Orthodox Jews have. Hmm? So how can he be a Jasad? In what way is he not a full human being? Or if I were to let the cat out of the bag, how can we recognize this automaton? <laughs> the answer is located in the analysis of what constitutes the self 
or what's sometimes called the ego. That a human being is endowed by Allah with an amana. Inna aradna al-amana ta'ala samawati wal alwal jibal. An amana, a trust. And when that amana was given to the human being, it elevated him to such a high status that Allah said to the angels, it's to do the Adam. Make sijda before Adam. This is not sijda of a bada. No. In the first page of the book of history, sijda is an act of respect, not of worship. And that sijda is a part of truth. A sijda where you bow down and prostrate yourself before a human being is an act of respect which is located in the first page of the book of history. Go check it out. It is only in this, the last chapter of the book of history, and only us, we are the only ones who are prohibited now from bowing down and prostrating. No, we can prostrate only before Allah. For us, this will be worship. We cannot worship other than Allah. Only this Ummah. But the Hindu wife, to this day, has preserved a part of the truth which is located on the first page of the book of history, and I have to tell the Hindu that because he doesn't know it. I have to tell him that you have preserved in Hinduism something which is located on the first page of the book of history, namely Sijda, as an act of respect. That's what the Hindu wife does when she touches the foot of her husband. She's not worshipping him. So what is it that Allah gave to the human being? That the angels were asked to make sijda, out of respect, not worship. What was this amana? Inna aradna al-amanata ala samawati wal adwal jibal. Answer, Allah gave to the human being What he did not give to the angels. Now, what is it? He gave to the human beings consciousness of self. The animals don't have that. The trees don't have that. But yes, an angel can say, I am Gabriel. I am Gibrail. So an angel does have consciousness of self. And the jinn, yes, Ana khayru minhu, I am better than him. The jinn can say I. They also have consciousness of self and so to the human beings. But the angels don't have a free will. They don't have a self-directed will. No. وَيَفْعَلُونَ مَا يُؤْمَرُونَ Whatever Allah orders, they have to act, it, act about, on it. Yes, the jinn do have, and so do the human beings. But there's something more. Allah has given to the human being what is known as a creative intellect, a capacity to pursue knowledge independently, not just book knowledge. A capacity to extend the frontiers of knowledge. A capacity for insight. Internal, intuitive, spiritual insight. A capacity for basira. And ta'bud Allah ka'anna katarah. But you should worship Allah as though you're seeing him with your internal sight. We are the only ones with that. 
If Iblis had that, Iblis would have recognized that I ought to bow down in respect for him. Iblis didn't have that. So Iblis felt I am better than him. He lacked the capacity to recognize what Allah had given to Adam alayhi salam. He didn't have the intellectual capacity. He didn't have the spiritual insight. And so he said, no, I'm not going to do it. Ana khayru minhu. Khalaqtani minna wa khalaqtahu min teen. All he could see in a human being is the clay. He couldn't see anything more than that. So this is what Allah gave to the human being. And I want to share with you when ending now. This is my my insight. You don't have to agree with me. In fact, I would be very pleased if you do not agree with me and you do your own homework and you think the way I had to think. That will please me very much. You climb the mountain. You tell me what it is to be a jasad. I say he's a jasad because he may have the capacity to say, yes, I am the Messiah. An al-Masih. That's what the Prophet said. He will say, an al-Masih. I am the Messiah. So he has self-consciousness. But I don't think he has a self-directed will. Because if you have a self-directed will, you can choose and you can make mistakes. But he is programmed not to make mistakes. Everything he does is programmed. Dajjal. So I say he's a jasad because he lacks a self-directed will or a free will. Mm -hmm. Secondly, I say he's a jasad because like the angels, he does not have a creative intellect. He does not have to think to get knowledge. Because when you think to make, get knowledge, you make mistakes, like I have made mistakes. Not him. <laughs> he doesn't make mistakes. Because he's not engaged in independent thinking. He does not possess a creative intellect. This is my understanding. So you may call it artificial intelligence. You can call it an automaton. But you know that in the, in the world at the end time, the world is going to become filled with Dajjals. People who lack the capacity to think for themselves. And Hollywood chooses for them and thinks for them. <laughs> and the cell phones thinks for them and television thinks for them. They lack the capacity for a creative thought. They cannot think. The art of thinking is gone. So they are shallow people. A world filled with shallow people. And number two, they lack the capacity to choose for themselves. Like the Dajjal. And Hollywood will choose for them. <laughs> And the children, most of all, will be like Dajjal. And the Pied Piper of Hamlin, he plays the tune, and they'll all dance to his tune, and he'll take them into the fire. With this, we'll end our session for today. We took for exactly one hour, and we have a little question and answer session now. Okay, thank you, Sheikh. Um, those brothers who want to ask questions directly, please come forward now. Otherwise, I have some questions as well. Is this working? No. No? Put it on. Yeah. Salam alaikum, Sheikh. Salam alaikum, Sheikh. Salam alaikum, Sheikh. Salam alaikum, in view of the fact, uh, as you state very eloquently, um, that we have no ability 
to stop the march of Gog and Magog in establishing the throne of the false Messiah, what do we as responsible Muslims have to do between now and what is the inevitable? Good question. Our Prophet said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, I leave behind me two things. He didn't say three. Did he? I leave behind me two things. If you hold on to them, you will never go astray. The first is the Quran. And if you want to find the second, look for it in the Quran. <laughs> yes. If you want to find the second one, don't look for it in Tehran. <laughs> no, look for it in the Quran. Lokad kana lakum fi Rasulillahi uswatun hasana. In kuntum tahibun Allah fatabiuni yahbibkum Allah. So the second is my way of life. The second is my way of life. But Tehran says something else. <laughs> if you hold on to the Quran and to the Sunnah of the Prophet, you will never go astray. Gog and Magog could do what they want. Dajjal can do what he wants. You will not go astray. Are we holding on to the Quran? Huh? No. We don't study the Quran anymore. No. We don't even recite the Quran anymore. No. We don't teach our children to recite the Quran. A man came to the Prophet and said, O Messenger of Allah, we have to recite the Quran. How much time should we take? Meaning, from cover to cover. In which language? French or English? Huh? Why are you so afraid to answer me? <laughs> yes. <laughs> the Quran says, recite what is easy for you. So the Prophet has to give an answer which conforms with the Quran. So he said, recite the whole Qur'an cover to cover once a month. Meaning a lunar month. The man said, O Messenger of Allah, I'm young and I'm strong, I can do better than that. So the Prophet said, okay, once every ten days, so three times for the month. The man said, O Messenger of Allah, I'm young and strong, I can do better than that. The Prophet said, okay, once a week, but not faster than that. If you recite it faster than that, you'll not be able to absorb the meaning. And so not only must we recite the whole Quran from cover to cover, at least once a month, but we must know enough of the language to be able to understand what we are reciting. In za'amtum. أَنَّكُمْ أَوْلِيَاءُ لِلَّهِ مِنْ دُونِ النَّاسِ فَتَمَنَّوُ الْمَوْتَ إِنْ كُنْتُمْ صَادِكِينَ Those are heavy words, you know. Oh yes, they're powerful words. But if you don't understand, it go through one ear, it come out of the other ear, and you will not understand why is the Jew shaking and shivering when he hears those words. إِنْ زَعَمْتُمْ he hit them so hard if you believe, if you claim you are the chosen people of the Lord God to the exclusion of all of mankind, then why don't you desire, why don't you desire death if you are truthful?
Hmm? So you have to understand what you are reciting. Can you do it when you come attend Salatu Tarawi? And the Quran is being recited at 95 miles an hour? <laughs> Can you do it? Have you ever cried the tears fell from your eyes in Salatu Tarawi? While he's reciting the Quran at 95 miles an hour and you're all there in the line like cattle. Up and down and up and down like cattle. Allowing him to recite at 95 miles an hour rather than leave the masjid and go back home. Forget him. And do your Salatu Tarawi by yourself alone. Rather than to disrespect the Quran this way. Yes, disrespect. How can you study the Quran and expect to penetrate the Quran and to be able to confront Dajjal and Gog and Magog and survive when you will not pick up the Quran every day to recite it? Life is too busy now. The Quran is living, it's not dead. The Quran knows who are those who are betraying the Quran and those who truly love the Qur'an. So my answer is, you can survive Gog and Magog. You can survive Dajjal if you hold on to the Qur'an and Sunnah. But if you want to hold on to the Qur'an and Sunnah, you not only must be faithful to the Qur'an, but you must learn to think. Next question. Will some Shias be misled in following the Jewish Messiah, the Dajjal, there is also a hadith which states that the Jal will appear from Isfahan, followed by 90,000 Jews. Mm. Is this connected? Mm. He is going to appear as a Jew, the Jal, but he's not Jewish. <laughs> no. Dajjal is someone created by Allah. And when Tamim Udari met him and questioned him, he told them, Tamim Udari, you better follow this man, the prophet who has come in Arabia. Follow him if you want to be. If you are correct, you must follow him. The Jew wouldn't say that. The Jew would not say follow Muhammad Islam, would he? Would he? But the Jah said, follow Muhammad Islam. So yes, he would be recognized as a Jew. And he's sent to test the Jews, but he's not himself actually a Jew. He's a special creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And yes, there is a hadith. The Dajjal will be followed by 70,000 Jews from Isfahan wearing their Persian shawls. I went to Isfahan. It's a beautiful city. They say of Isfahan that it is Nisfu Jaha. Uh, do we have anyone from Iran here? Nobody from Iran? <laughs> Nisfu Jaha. I mean, a half of the world is here in Isfahan. So beautiful is the city. But when I went to Isfahan, I found something remarkably mysterious. That the city was inundated with European tourists. Inundated. No other city in Iran except Isfahan. <laughs> and they all say in one part of the hotel, one part of the city, in one hotel. The, the hotel is teeming, full, packed with European tourists. And they're not from Russia. They're not from the Orthodox Christian world. They're from this side, the Western world. And so the link between Dajjal and Isfahan don't think that he's talking about Iranian nationals who are supporters of the Islamic revolution in Iran, that these are the people of Dajjal. No. It is more likely 
that the Jews who have fled Iran, fled Iran, and other Jews who were never born in Iran, are targeting Iran. This is Dajjal's attack. And they're using Isfahan as a cover, tourism cover, for the effort to try to penetrate Iran. Next question. This brother has got a bit of a challenge for you, Sheikh. Let me ask him to ask the question. Why is the clarification of our challenge? Uh, originally, he said that uh, one is Gog and one is Magog, i.e., West is Gog and Russia Magog. Then he said that uh, Gog and Magog is actually located within the both camps. And then he said the West is uh, Gog and Magog. Uh, can you clarify that a little bit? Yeah. Okay, there are two yeah. things here. It's a bit confused. There are two things here. He will come from the east, he'll come from the east, he'll come from the east. And Britain is in the west. It's not Gog and Magog, it's Dajjal. The Hadith is that he'll come from the east. Remember? And I said east and west belong to this material universe. Do you, hold, you don't have east and west in the Samawat. So it's only when the shadow has ended, the three stages of his mission have been completed. Wasairu ayamihi ka ayamikum, and he's now in our world of space and time. It is only at this time that he'll come from the east, riding on a donkey, and the donkey will travel as fast as the clouds. And the donkey he'll have his head stretched out. Why? But before that, he is in this world. But he is starting from an island, and I said, my understanding is that the island is Britain. What about Gog and Magog? When Gog and Magog are released, said the Prophet, the first of them will pass by the Sea of Galilee on their way to Jerusalem. If you are passing on the way to Jerusalem and you're going to pass by the Sea of Galilee, you're coming from the north. Do they teach geography in Britain? They do? All right. So, Gog and Magog will have to be coming from the north because they're heading to Jerusalem. And on the way to Jerusalem, they're passing by the Sea of Galilee. The Sea of Galilee is located the north of Jerusalem, north. So, Gog and Magog will have to come from the north. Tamim Udari went on board a ship. Ships normally travel on water, don't they? So we're looking for a body of water close to the Holy Land, close to Medina. It could either be the Red Sea or the Mediterranean Sea. It won't be on that side. It can't be the Red Sea because this ship travels for a whole month in the storm before reaching land. The Red Sea in 10 minutes, you reach land. <laughs> so it has to be the Mediterranean Sea. Okay? And uh, they travel to reach Britain. But if we look for a body of water to the left, is it only the Mediterranean Sea? The sun is setting in the west. No, there is a second body of water north of the Mediterranean Sea. What is it? The Black Sea. The visibility of water in the Mediterranean Sea is a couple meters deep. But vis visibility in the Black Sea is only about one meter. This is why Allah refers to it as Ainun Hamia. Dark and murky. 
And the companion, sorry, the Mufassil of the Quran, Ibn Kathir, agrees. He says it's the Black Sea. So Gog and Magog are located between the Black Sea on this side. And which sea is on that side? The Caspian Sea. And between the Black Sea and the Caspian Sea, an unbroken chain of mountains, what is it called? The Caucasus Mountains. And there's only one pass in the Caucasus Mountains, only one. You can't miss it. It's called the Dariel Gorge. And there you find the people who speak a language, the Georgian language, which is unconnected with all the regional languages. And it is in that region of the world, right there, you find the abundance of iron ore that Zulkarnain used to build the barrier of iron. Atuni Zubar al-Hadid. Zubar al-Hadid. Hmm? And so now we say, Gog and Magog have to be located on the north of the Caucasus Mountains. Who they are is not so important. But they are going to eventually take control of power in the world. Is it the Vikings? Not only will they take power in the world, but they're going to bring the Jews back to the Holy Land. Did the Vikings bring them back to the Holy Land? Bring the evidence. But about the Khaza, yes. We know that the Khaza converted to Judaism. That's a historical fact. And we know that some of the Khaza who were Jews then converted to Christianity. So you had Khaza on this side and Khaza on that side. And they were able, playing both sides, to be able to forge the Judeo-Christian alliance, the Zionist alliance, about which Allah has spoken in the Quran. When he said, لا تتخذوا اليهود والنصارى أولياء Which Jews and which Christians is he talking about? Oh, but the answer is right there. بَعَدُهُمْ أَوْلِيَاءُ بَعْدُ بَعَدُهُمْ أَوْلِيَاءُ بَعْدُ Do not take such Jews and such Christians as your friends and allies who بَعَدُهُمْ أَوْلِيَاءُ بَعْدُ don't take such Jews and such Christians as your friends and allies who themselves are friends and allies of each other. I think that's enough. Just to follow on, Sheikh, with the previous uh, explanation, is a similar question to say, can you explain why the meaning of Dawah is a hadith? was a vision and not a real life experience or even a dream. I came to the conclusion that it could not have been a real life experience in our material universe. Why? Because when Tamim Uddari saw Dajjal, he saw him as a human being. <laughs> And he saw him with chains on his neck. The only time you could see Dajjal as a human being is when the chains have already been removed a long, long time ago. Are you understanding me? You didn't understand? When, when Tamimu Dajjal saw, when Tamimu Dari saw Dajjal, he saw him as a human being. But he also saw him in chains. He was chained. But the only time you could see Dajjal as a human being is when he is in our material universe in our world of space and time. And by that time, he would be at the end of his mission. Stage one and stage two and stage three would all have been completed. 
And the chains would have been removed long, long, long ago. So you cannot see the Jal as a human being and also in chains. Logically impossible. Still don't understand? Yeah. So when he saw him as a human being and in chains, the implication is, this is the vision. There are three events which are all connected with each other. If you know how to connect the dots. The first was the Armenian genocide. It was not. The Ottoman Empire, which claimed to be a Khilafah state, not that Ottoman Empire, which committed the genocide of the Armenians in 1914. No. Very few people remember today that the body of Firaun was discovered in 1897, 98, just at the same time when the Zionist movement was created. And Allah says, I have done this. لِتَكُونَ لِمَنْ خَلْفَكَ آيَةً That I have preserved the body of Fir'aun. So that when this body is rediscovered, لِتَكُونَ لِمَنْ خَلْفَكَ آيَةً That this body will be a sign for a people to come after that they will live the way he lived and they'll die the way he died. Am I, uh, have you understood now? لِتَكُونَ لِمَنْ خَلْفَكَ آيَةً That they will live the way he lived, oppressing. Go take a look at Gaza and you'll see. <laughs> Naked oppression. They will live the way he lived and they will die the way he died. I went into a Jewish synagogue in the United States with 200 Jews present and I told them that. <laughs> I told them that to their faces. They couldn't believe it. When the lecture was over, they surrounded me. <laughs> I have these memories from the United States. That you will live the way he lived and you will die the way he died. This was 1897. So now look at the events. 1902. And the Zionist movement succeeds in bringing together a conference in Paris to plot regime change in Constantinople. 1902. It took them six years. And by 1908, they succeeded. I can't believe I still can't believe it how they did it in six years. And Sultan Abdul Hamid was toppled. And the new people who came to take over the state were secular people. Mustafa Kamal's gang. Secular nationalists who despise Islam. <laughs> despise Islam. 
And this is the regime that they committed the genocide of the Armenian people, deliberate genocide. Yes, deliberate. Why? To sabotage. To sabotage any end time friendship and alliance between the world of Islam and the Orthodox Christian world. Mm. That's the reason for the Armenian genocide. And then came Srebrenica. And when the full story of who it is who orchestrated Srebrenica, when that is shown to you, you will have to put your tail between, behind your necks and go and beg for forgiveness. Because like dumb fools, you are swallowing the story that comes out of the oppressor. That the Serbian nation, the Orthodox Christian nation, was so bloodthirsty that they are the ones who massacred all the Muslims in Srebrenica. And this poor fool called Imran Hussein refuses to call it a genocide because you know her British, her majesty's British government can't be mistaken. When Britain took the matter to the Security Council to have it declared that this was genocide, Imran, had, Imran Hussein said no. No, it cannot be a genocide. Yes, it was a massacre. Most certainly a massacre. And when the story is told on that day, on Judgment Day, you'll know who orchestrated it. The same people who want to sabotage any end time friendship and alliance between Muslims and Orthodox Christians, they are the ones who orchestrated the massacre in Srebrenica to put the blame on the entire Serbian nation. But the Serbs are themselves sorry for what happened. The Serbs are themselves saying, find out who are the ones responsible and punish them. But like a pack of hungry, let me not use the word, the deaf, dumb and blind cannot see that this was an effort to sabotage an end time friendship and alliance between the Muslim world and the Orthodox Christian world. And then ISIS comes along. And if Russia had not intervened in Syria, there would have been a genocide. These bloodthirsty so-called jihadists who have no shame who could take weapons from Santa Claus and take money from Santa Claus to go and wage their bogus jihad would have slaughtered all the Christians of Syria. And if that had happened, that would have put the last nail in the coffin that there would be no possibility ever of friendship and alliance between Muslims and Orthodox Christians. That's the answer to you concerning Srebrenica. Remember my words, because in the grave you see their story and you see that I am correct, that there were hidden hands at work. This was not a genocide because the Serbian people did not celebrate over this. They did not like what happened. They are sorry for what happened and they would very much like to see those who committed the massacre to be punished for it. If you want to see a genocide, take a look at what the Western world did in the United States to the American Indians. They don't apologize up to now. Up to now. Next question. What is the etymology of Yajut and Majuj? And are there two tribes of people or one tribe described by conjoining? How do Yajut and Majuj communicate with and how They are a people who have the footprints of oppressors, the footprints of godlessness, the footprints of facade, corrupting everything, the male-female relationship, is that men should be attracted to women, that men are the hunters and women are the hunted. 
And a family is constructed of a husband and a wife. And they are hell-bent on destroying this. And replacing it with a, ma a marriage of a man with another man. And a woman with another man. And so a child now has two daddies. <laughs> yes, two daddies. And uh, if you do not enact legislation to support this godless agenda, they attack your money. And you have inflation. So they're all scared of them. This is Gog and Magog. Footprints of oppressors. Footprints of facade. But how come there are two footprints instead of one? There should be one uniform print, footprints, isn't it? So how come two? Shall I show you the two? These are the people who have given us the scientific and technological revolution. These are the masters of modern technology. They teach engineering to the world. They teach technology to the world. They want to bring a uniform, uniform world of business, of money, and so on. Well then, how come one side of their world, you drive on the right side of the road, and in another part of their world, you drive on the left side of the world. Don't they have even elementary common sense? What's wrong that they cannot uniform standardize it because it's dangerous? You're driving from London to Paris. And when you cross over from Dover to Calais and you're driving to Paris, and you're looking at this big truck with a, hundred, a dozen vehicles on it, and the man is coming straight at you. What's wrong with him? He's sleeping. He's driving on the wrong side of the road. And then when about the truck is about to crush you, then you realize, oh no, I'm driving on the wrong side of the road. You see how dangerous it is? Have you ever done it? Drive on the other side of the road? It's dangerous. So how come they have not standardized it? This is Britain, that's France. Now, the world will come to an end, but they will not standardize it. Why? You have to have two footprints for the same people. So you can understand. Shall I continue? You buy, <laughs> you buy your gasoline. In France, you buy it with liters, don't you? And you come over to Britain, they sell it in gallons here? Yeah? Or in liters? Gallons? Yeah. Or you buy gas? Liters now. Liters. Well, in the United States, it's gallons. How come? Why don't you have the metric system for everybody? In the United States, it's gallons. You buy gasoline by the gallons. And over here, you buy by the liters. Why the two footprints? Uh, you, when, you buy, um, when you buy fruits, do you buy by the kilo, kilogram? The kilo? Yeah. When you go to the United States, they don't buy by kilograms. They buy by the pounds. Why the two footprints? Huh? Why the two footprints? Uh, what's the temperature today? Is it 30 degrees? Or is it 28 degrees? Go with this nonsense to the United States. Oh, no, no, we have the Fahrenheit. What nonsense is this? Why two footprints when there should be one? And the one that always gets me angry. Oh, yes. You take your laptop computer and you want to plug in. <laughs> <laughs> you want to plug in, and this is the part of the world 
which, which is technologically most advanced. And a simple thing like standardizing the electrical outlets. And these donkeys cannot standardize it. And you have to go through this enormous difficulty of getting adapter for here and an adapter for there and an adapter for there. Why different footprints when there should be one? If you have the answer, tell me. I'd love to hear the answer. But I know the answer is this. This is Allah's way of telling you there are two footprints when there should be only one. This is Gog and that's Magog. Maybe one more question, Sheikh. We'll need a break after that. Question on the Jal, Gog and Magog. How do Gog and Magog communicate with the Jal? Is it black magic? What is the link between the Jal and the Bliss? We'll take only Gog and Magog and the Jali, we will leave after time being. Kulauzu bi Rabbil Falak. Kulauzu bi Rabbil Nas. Is it by accident that Allah ends the Quran with this? Eh? <laughs> this is called Al Mawizatain. The two surahs with a warning in them. Kulauzu bi Rabbil Falak, Kulauzu bi Rabbil Nas. Allazi yuwaswisu fi sudurin nas. Allazi yuwaswisu fi sudurin nas. Min al jinnati wa nas. So when Dajjal wants to communicate, all he has to do is to whisper into the heart. That's it. Can we have a break now? We have a long session. Shake needs the rest.